Well, good morning to you. We're certainly glad that you've uh, chosen to worship with us online. Uh, we're currently in this uh, series called Poised Together, A Journey Through First Peter. And so I invite you to open up your Bibles to the second chapter of First Peter. Uh, this is a picture of a city that most of you have never seen before. And I'm almost certainly that you have never been. The year was 1976. The month was July. The city is Valdivia, Chile. It's a population of around 200,000 people. The venue is a basketball gymnasium that I remember. The purpose is proclaiming the excellencies of Christ through playing basketball, singing, testimony, Bible correspondence course, and Christian sportsmanship. The team, sports ambassadors. And uh, I remember like it was yesterday. We went for a shoot around in the afternoon before our evening game. And a man approached me and asked, uh, well, what's your record so far? He knew we had played already in Ecuador and Bolivia and many different uh, cities in Chile. And I said, oh, I think we're like 22 and 1. And he looked me straight in the eye and he said, you'll be 22 and 2 after the game tonight. Uh, <laughs> And he was right. But when we got to the gymnasium at night, he was actually the opposing coach. <laughs> they fouled out 10 of my players. And uh, Chip Ingram, a missionary named David Bromley, who suited up for that game, Keith Brown, an OC missionary, myself, were the only ones left on the court. Two of my players we had to take to the hospital as they had some stitches in their forehead. But uh, guess what? All of the 7,000 spectators that were jammed in with overcoats and gloves because it was wintertime knew that it was a hometown officiated game and it wasn't really fair. Now, it was not a pretty game, but I believe Christ was honored. And at halftime, we shared our testimonies and we sang our songs and all the people there, by and large, listened through interpretation. But you see, I had my players prepared for the kind of treatment that they were going to get in all the different countries that we played in that five-week trip. Peter has been preparing the believers that are in Asia Minor, the churches that are there, for what they were currently facing, and it was going to occur at deeper levels. The title of what I want to share with you today is, When Life Just Ain't Fair. Questions. Have you ever had people lie about you to others? Sense that God has abandoned you, perhaps? Had your dreams shattered? Felt like you've been dealt a bad hand? Ever been done in by someone very, very perhaps close to you? Blame God for your hard, difficult circumstances? How about this one? Wanted to throw in the towel and just give up and quit. Well, friends, welcome to life in a fallen world. I have a statement here <clears throat> that I want to share with you. And when we talk about persecution, we talk about suffering, we talk about trials, uh, some of it is relative to us here in the West. Some of it we can't really identify with unless you've lived in other countries. And many believers face intense persecution, as we just not too long ago talked about the persecuted church. But those of us in the West tend not to experience much beyond what I would refer to as just social pressure. And then it begs the question, are we merely pursuing comfort? Or are we willing to swim against our culture and take up the cross of Christ and live for him? Now, I have a thesis that I want to share with you this morning. It may not be right, you may not agree with me, but it's my thesis. If all you have is the skewed human perspective on trial, suffering, or persecution, instead of a divine one, I can tell you something. You will probably most and constantly be disillusioned, disappointed, maybe even depressed, 
And for sure, joy will never be your portion. But for us as Christ followers, look, we've been changed from the inside out. We've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. I was reminded when Jesus told some parables in Matthew chapter uh, 13, the disciples wanted to know, hi, you're explaining these parables to us, but what about the others? And he said to them, blessed are your eyes because they do see and your ears because they do hear. We cannot expect the world to think the way we think. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it tells us that the natural man, that's what you were before Christ opened your heart and my heart. The natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. He cannot understand them. They're foolishness. But we have his spirit. And Paul goes on to say, we actually have the mind of Christ. And so we need to think critically, biblically, strategically, as we live in this fallen world and the world treats us many times unjustly. Let me read the passage that we're looking at today. I hope you have your Bibles open, as I mentioned before, to Second Peter, or the second chapter of First Peter. Um, Darren preached last week on this whole idea of submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution. And so it's, it's talking about civil life and governments and kings and emperors and presidents and prime ministers. And he ends it and says, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And now in verse 18, he addresses a specific group of people, servants. And you, you uh, should remember that during the Roman Empire, they, they tell us that there were probably as many as 60 million servants. Uh, not necessarily slaves like we think perhaps of, of slavery, but many of them were doctors and lawyers and, and high positions that they held, but, but someone else was, was over them. And he, Peter is writing to tell them how they are to respond and how they were to live despite the persecution that they were facing and persecution that was probably going to increase. Now, there were some slaves. Uh, when Rome went out to conquer and they conquered another uh, country or whatever, they would bring back uh, those who they had captured, and those would be real slaves. And according to uh, William Barclay and, and many other commentators, they were just treated as things. They were not treated as people really at all. And so how do you live in this kind of a life? How do you live under authority? Let me share with you some thoughts about submission. It's mentioned in verse 13. It's mentioned in verse 18. And the word submission, when we think about it in our culture today, it evokes concerns about sexism, racism, dehumanization. Unfortunately, there have been good reasons, as we know, to draw such conclusions. But the true purpose of biblical submission, however, is not to sanction any type of inequality, but to honor Jesus even in the most difficult circumstances, offering an attitude of humility towards those who are deserving of it, mirrors the unmerited favor God graciously gives to us, to you and to me. When submission is modeled, by all believers, male and female, evenly, young and old, rich, poor, educated, uneducated. It is no longer enslaving, but it is very, very liberating. Christ has set us free so that we might love him and that we might love others. Now, this is what Peter says. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect. Not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. 
For what credit is there or big deal when you sin and you're harshly treated? In other words, you deserve that. But when you look at it from God's perspective, you endure it with patience. But if you do what is right and suffer for it, patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. Now let me break down these three verses and just share uh, Peter's instruction and exhortation to these alien strangers, foreigners, exiles. Uh, but there are implications for you and for me as we're going to see today. So this is, this is the command. This is not some suggestion. Uh, Peter says, no, servants, be submissive to your masters. Some masters were good. Some masters were unkind. Some masters were authoritarians. Some masters beat their, their slaves and those that were under them. But we are to submit to authority. The dilemma in the midst of all of this is when you have an unreasonable master. Why in the world should I obey a master? Why should I obey my employer when he does things that are underhanded or uh, other uh, things that come up where we're not treated in a proper way? way. Peter's addressing this. He tells us exactly how we're, what we're to do. We're to bear up under these things. It's an issue for us because we want what's right all the time. And then there's the motive. Why should we bear up under these difficult circumstances and with unreasonable, unkind masters? Well, we do it for, for Jesus' sake. It tells us that in the previous verses that, as I said, Darren looked at last week. And, and we do it for, in verse 19, for the sake of conscience toward God. In other words, we're under his authority. And look at the prize in all of this. The fact is, you get God's approval. You get God's, God's clap. This finds favor with God, verse 19. End of verse 20, you endure these trials, persecution, suffering, whatever you go through in a godly way, this finds favor with God. Just like Yahweh said about Job, have you seen my servant Job down there? Ah, there's nobody blameless, upright, walking like, like him. No, oh, he was approved by God. And we want to gain God's approval. And we do it when we live a godly life in the midst of difficult circumstances. The impact of all of this, well, it brings glory to God. It finds favor with God. So, so God is well pleased. And he is the one that we want to please anyway. Just like children, when, especially when they're small, they, they love to get their parents' approval. They, they do things to get attention and get approval. They want you to play with them and notice them and so on. But that, that's the impact. It's God's glory. And that's, he's the one we're living for, and he's the one we want to bring honor to. Now, the model for this in Peter's instructions, and this is the message for next week, is none other than the Lord Jesus himself. In fact, verse 21, you should look at it because all of this that has to do with suffering and persecution and difficult times and trials says you've been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps. So <laughs> you realize that, that this is God's call? It's a privilege like the early disciples uh, in, in Acts chapter uh, 4 to suffer in Acts chapter 5 for Jesus' sake? So I think it breaks down these verses very well. But what I want to share with you today, and more importantly, is how in the world does this play out in our daily lives? How does it play out to those that Peter was writing to? And the examples that I'm going to use in here, in terms of what I call Peter principles, are all found... In uh, the rest of the book, and uh, examples of them, whether it be scriptures or exact uh, stories about people, it's, it's in the God's word. There's a plethora of them. 
So let's look, if you would, at Peter's principles applied. How should we respond when we go through difficult circumstances, when we're treated unfairly, when people just are unju plain unjust and mean? They gossip about you. They tell things that are not true about you. As I just mentioned, one of the things you need to remember is this is your lot in life. Welcome to Christianity 101 in the first century. That's what Peter is writing to them. Don't be surprised at these fire ordeals. You have been called for this purpose. So that's the yoke that we have. When you signed up on the dotted line, so to speak, to follow the Lord Jesus, uh, he didn't mince any words. You want to come after me? You've got to deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. You, you must give up the right to your possessions, the right to your own ideas, your own agenda. And you fall in line because his, his path is a good path for you. It's an upright path. It's a healthy path. It'll be a joyful journey despite the issues that you face in life. Secondly, you know when you're treated unjustly, ah, that's just not fair. You need to banish from your mind, I need to banish from my mind a victim mentality like I, I, I don't deserve this and we respond in ways that are, that are ungodly. Look at, look at verse 8. 18, be submissive not only to those who are uh, gentle, but those who are unreasonable. Look what happened to Job. He had everything taken away from him. All his family, the, the pairs, the sons, his daughters, his cattle, everything. What was his response? The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. There was no self-pity in all of that. And then... He was, his health, his own health was attacked. And in all these things, Job did not sin with his lips. How about you? How about me? How often do we fall into temptation and we sin with our lips? Things that come out of our hearts. And, and, and that's why we need the Spirit of God within us, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, if all you go about is have a victim mentality, you will wallow. In fact, I would submit that you'll probably drown in your self-pity. No, it's your calling in life. Thirdly, you want to endure patiently? You have to adopt a God consciousness. That God is working in the, in the midst of it. That it finds favor with God. That God is aware of everything that takes place. Uh, in your notes, it's not up here on the screen, but in your notes there's an example of David in, in the book of uh, 1 Samuel. You may remember after Absalom steals the kingdom and David is, is on the run, that a, a guy named uh, Shimei starts cursing uh, David. And uh, some of David's men wanted, wanted to slay him. But you know what David said? He said, you know what? <clears throat> God has allowed this. He's, he has him for, for a reason. Maybe God has spoken through him. And so he did not take into his hands things into his own hands. He let God handle it. You see, he entrusted himself to Yahweh, the judge of all the earth. And so when you go through these things, when you are slandered, when people say things that are totally untrue about you, entrust yourself to the judge. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. Look at verse 23. He kept. He had many occasions when he had things that people said about him that were completely untrue. I mean, they had to take two or three witnesses against him, you know, to put him there on the cross. He entrusted himself to the one who judges 
righteously. Leave it in God's hands. Vengeance is God's. He can repay. And he doesn't repay all the time in this life. He'll, he'll repay at the final judgment. So entrust. Give it over to him. You can put your head down on a pillow at night. Otherwise, you're wallowing in anger and revenge. And, and uh, it, well, it'll eat you up inside. Then we should absorb, I call it, the wounds that come from other people. Hey, look, you've wounded people. I've wounded people. But what happens? How should we respond when we are wounded? Jesus is on, on the cross, and he bore in his body our sins. When they were hurling abuses at him on the cross, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And there are people that they, they don't know what they're doing. And why should we expect the world to treat us in a nice, kind, and loving way? That's, that's just not normal in a fallen world. Unfortunately, it happens all too often in the church when we become anger angry and we become bitter, we become resentful and we lash out. You know, you should absorb the wounds that come from other people like he absorbed our sins, iniquities, transgressions on the cross. Jesus uttered no threats. So be very careful um, not to lash out. And that leads to the next one. You need to forget about canceling out anyone, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their educational background, regardless of where they come from, whether they're male or female, whether they're young or, or, or old. We are to respect all people, all men. And if you focus your eyes and you just turn ahead a little bit in chapter 4, verse 7, it says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Don't cancel anybody out. Pray for them. Though they injure you, though they're unreasonable, though your mate doesn't treat you like you deserve, though your husband isn't loving you like Christ loved the church, though your wife doesn't respect you, though your children don't always listen to you, though your employer doesn't gives you the advancements that you really deserve. No. What are we to do? Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. We are to continue to reach out to those who have injured you, to those who have harmed you. Look, those questions that we had at the beginning, you had anybody ever tell any lies about you or, or, or do you in and talk behind your back and accuse you of this or that? Friends, I've, I've experienced that in 45 years of, of ministry prior to that, just in life general. I've experienced that from other pastors, from other missionaries, from Bible college or Christian college professors. Huh? So what do you do? I've had some instances <clears throat> that are completely untrue. So what do you do? Cancel that person. I'm never going to talk to you again. I'm not going to, I'm going to refrain. I'm going to back away. I'm going to pull out. That's not an option for us. No, I have some individuals that I have continued to try to reach out to that have never come and asked for forgiveness, though they know they're wrong. It's okay. What did Jesus do? What did he do with Peter? After Peter denied him three times. Well, Peter, you're history, man. See you later. No, go and tell Peter that I've risen from the dead. We're not to cancel out anybody. Last week, Darren talked about a balance beam. Stay, friends. On the balance beam, keep your focus on the purpose that God has for you regarding your own identity. You know, we're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We're a chosen race. We're, 
We're, we're God's people. And when you're on the balance beam and, and you feel like you're tottering this way or that way, stay there. God has a purpose in all of that. Don't opt out off of what he wants to do in your life and in my life. Cooperate with the Spirit of God. Learn the lessons that he wants you and I to learn. Then, <laughs> Peter goes on in chapter 4, and he, verse 14, and says this, If you are reviled, notice now, for the name of Christ... This is real persecution. It's not just because we live in a fallen world and, oh, woe is me, I experience some, some issues. No. For the name of Christ, you are, look at blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. We're to glory in our high position. God's spirit is working. And you should remember that these momentary Light afflictions, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, they're working for you and me. <laughs> Can you believe that? They're working for you and me so that we, we, not just temporary, but eternal weight of glory. That's what God gives. He rewards those who diligently seek him. So glory in your high position. People... <clears throat> They, they want to go up. They want the high position. D don't do that. Jesus said, hey, when you, when you go to some kind of a wedding or celebration or whatever, don't just take the front, the front row. No, go in the back. Maybe they'll usher you up to the front. So take the low position. Take the low road. When you come to chapter 5, it, it talks so much about humbling yourselves under the mighty hand of God. He will exalt you in due time. He's able to do that. And then Peter goes on in chapter 5 and, he's, and, and what I would call employ counterterrorism tactics. Look at what it says in verse 8 of chapter 5. Be of sober spirit. This, it, three times I think it's mentioned to be of sober spirit. In other words, take things seriously. Be on the alert. For what? For who? Your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Lions, when they're looking at prey, do not roar. They, they roar afterwards or after they're finished eating or they, when they wake up in the morning, they sleep about 20 hours a day, something like that. But like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, the enemy wants to destroy you. And we are to, to uh, employ counterterrorism <laughs> tactics. Exactly what Jesus did in Matthew chapter 4 when he was tempted by Satan. Forty days, forty nights, without food, without water, Satan comes in the midst of that. And he tests him in the areas of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And every single time, the tactic that Jesus used was a rhema from the book of Deuteronomy. It is written, it is written, it is written. He didn't argue with Satan. He didn't try to get in some kind of a discussion with Satan and reason things out. The enemy is not reasonable. He seeks to kill and steal and destroy. That's why you need the shield of faith so you and I can uh, extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. So rejoice then in his workmanship. Look at verse 10. Wow, Th this verse here? After you have suffered for a little while. How long is a little while? It can be a long, long time. It can be years perhaps. Notice the God of all grace. That's the kind of God we serve who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. We've got this inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, not fade away. Our future is as bright as the promises of God, and it all awaits us. Now, notice what he's going to do. He himself will perfect. These are all different words. Each one actually is a message. Can perfect, then confirm, 
then strengthen, and then establish you. He wants you to grow up. And so we're to rejoice in his workmanship. Like Ephesians chapter 2 says, we're his masterpiece. He's working on us. And these trials and, and, and things refine us. They, sh- they sharpen us up. They take off all the rough places in our lives. And so what we, you and I should do is, is give God then the space to work. We say, Lord, have at it. Do what you need to do in my life to keep me at a point of need. Because to you be the dominion forever and ever. I have a basketball player named Melvin Adams. And Melvin was a little all-American Christian college. Uh, he was MVP at a tournament. We won our first national title. And he would always, for three years, uh, I had him as a player. He played for the Harlem Globetrotters for two years. He was a small little guard. He would, you know, slide around on the floor and dribble. But every practice he would say, Coach, push me. What do I need to improve on? Give God space to work. That's what he does. He's, he's perfecting you through all of what you're going through. Don't opt out of his master training program. And then, friends, we are to stand firm in God's grace. I have written to you briefly, verse 12, is exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. And God's grace is more than just kind and merited favor. God's grace is a dynamic uh, that empowers you and me. As Paul said, I labored more than all of the apostles. But he didn't pat himself on the back, tell how great he was. Yet not I, but the grace of God in me. It was all God's grace. And it's God's grace in your life and in my life. And then lastly, treasure your intimate ally. God is for you, my friends. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, now he will freely give us all things. He's the treasure. He's the pearl of great, great price. He's on your side. He's for you. He will never, under any circumstance, leave you or forsake you in the midst of the most horrendous, unjust circumstances that you face in life. <clears throat> There's a song <clears throat> that I was reminded of this week called Living for Jesus. It says, living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. We're talking about a journey now. This is the pathway of blessing for me. Peter's laid out a pathway for blessing, God's favor. And then the the refrain says this. Can you say this from the bottom of your heart? Can I? Oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee. Why should we? For thou and thy atonement didst give thyself for me. I owe no other master. My heart shall be thy throne. My life I give. Henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. All you have looking forward is the rest, friend and friends, of your life. And if you want to live it and experience the joy that only Jesus can give, My heart shall be your throne, my life I give. Henceforth, the rest of it, O Christ, for you alone. Father, we don't always know your plans and your purposes in terms of the small details in life, but we do have the big picture And we do know your plans and purposes. And we do know for certain that you delight when your children shine as lights in the midst of a wicked and perverse world. And when we bear up under sorrows while suffering unjustly, we demonstrate your person, your work, 
in our life. And it's one of the ways, by our good deeds, by our lives, that we proclaim your excellencies. When we go through issues and we give you the credit as to how we were able to endure and hold on and be patient and trust, it brings you much praise and honor and glory. And we want to do that until you return or we take our last breath. So, Father, bless my brothers, my sisters. If there's anyone here who's never yet come to you, gotten in the yoke with you, man, they're trying to live life alone, that's a dead-end street. It's a blind alley. Uh, They need you. We cannot bear up in this world without supernatural help from above. Thanks for loving us first. May we love you and love others in the same way. Amen.